oh, no, I never hit record or anything <laughs> like that. So I mean, epic fail. That got to do it again. Got to yeah. But yeah. So now um, I'm always. Your background looks good. You have it perfectly squared and centered and everything. Like, where, where, where are you right now? I'm in my apartment. This is usually like when I take calls, I'm trying to make it like look really cute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had a call with um, a treatment center rep uh, last week and her, everything was, per I mean, it, it was perfect. Really? Per I mean, it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's just like a woman thing. You know what I mean? Like, hold on. I want to get the angle in just right. So, okay, so where, where do you want to focus the combo today? Um, so good question. So, um, the conversations that I have with people are, are typically they're, they're fairly, um, casual, right? Oh. So, so, you know, I like to, you know, find out about the person. I want to find out about you, what's your history. I think you're doing some really interesting stuff. Now you're doing some great videos. But like, what, what's the motivator? What got, you know, what's the pain point? What got you there? What, what was, what was the, you know, the, the moment of, you know, holy shit, something's got to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so just that kind of, and then the conversation, and then usually I jump in with questions and mm -hmm. it's pretty casual and um, but I love your subject matter. I mean, codependency is just, you know, such, you know, it goes so deep. I, I'm reading a book right now by, uh, what's his name? Call, call, uh, it's called The Body Keeps the Score. Mm, I just yeah. started that too. Really what do you think? Good. Really? Uh, yeah, I love it. I mean, I wish I had, you know, I was thinking last night, I wish I had been given this book when I was 15, mm. uh, but I wouldn't have read it. And even if I did read it, it probably wouldn't mean anything to me. I probably wouldn't have been able to, to uh, bring it home in any way. I wouldn't, you know. mm. I, I needed a good 48 years to let things sit and then, and then understand like, yeah, I know I get it. How, how do you like the book? I just started. Um, so, I mean, I feel like, cause I, I got it on, um, on not Kindle on, um, audio and it's like nine ads, or no, it's like 16 hours or something. Like it's a long one. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm trying to take my time and I'm feeling a little resistance too. Why? Um, what do you mean? Like resistance to reading it. Like I want to know the information, but there's part of me that feels like it's going to be awakened and I'm like nervous about that <laughs> uh, you know probably um, it's um, it's pretty interesting so um, so tell so give me a two second thing let's let's get started okay I may edit some of this out I may not I, I like the casual banter yeah same. Uh, I, li I like the live in studio effect you know <laughs> Um, so, um, so let's get started. So tell me, so this morning I have with me Katie Shannon, who I met when, uh, I was in commercial real estate in my last career and, uh, Katie had a brief stint in commercial real estate too. Uh, she got three she was smart three months. That's <laughs> it lasted three months. It took you three months to figure out what I figured out in 22 years. So I, I think you're, you're really ahead of the game. You know, I don't know about you, but I got into commercial real estate because I was, you know, when I started in New York, I was going to be that guy. I was going to be rich. I was going to have that house in the Hamptons. I, I was going to be that guy. Mm -hmm. And um, and there was a point I really believed that. But then, you know, in the end, it was like, wow, I'll just be happy to just pay the mortgage right now, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's so much easier living in fantasy. In our it, current it reality. Is. It is. I, yeah. I do. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I don't know exactly where on the recovery spectrum you fall. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I know you, you're on the codependent side. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe that you're in recovery yourself from addiction or. Um, so actually, since we last talked back in December, I decided um, that I wanted to try sobriety out from alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, 
Because Does that mean really... all substances? That means all mood altering substances or? No, so I wanna be really honest yeah. about this. So okay. I, um, although I don't feel like I am a drug and alcohol addict, I 100% know that alcohol is an accessory behavior for me to my mm -hmm. main addictions. Okay. And it's a huge accelerator. Um, and especially when it comes to my moods. So I don't feel like I need it, um, but when I have it, it can just, it can change, it can accelerate whatever I'm feeling at that time. And I, I realize like, I just don't wanna live like that anymore. Um, yeah. And other substances that I do do, so I um, do use psilocybin and um, MDA, which is sassafras, but I use it in, 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 um, with, in a healing uh, way um, mm -hmm. with somebody else administering it um, in a safe setting. Um, and I do it specifically for healing work and, um, and um, awakening, if you will. And I do that mm -hmm. probably like four times a year. And I've done ayahuasca as well. Okay. And, 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 and I know people have gone down that path and, you know, and everybody walks a very different path. But I, I just want to say for anybody that's watching this, that's um, and it's usually families or, or whatever, or anyone that's new to recovery or or in recovery, that you know we define abstinence as you know, no mood altering substances whatsoever. Yeah, um, you know. So and, and you know that, and I'm not I'm not lecturing you. I know what you know. I just I just want for the people out there that are because a lot of people come in and they're like, well. well you know, I can't drink, but can I still, you know, smoke crack or can I, you know, they'll yeah, come up with that. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So. And I just want to be really honest with my story and, and my yeah. in other programs. And, Absolutely. you know, my brother is actually, um, he'll probably be sober two years from all substances. Um, and that's Excellent. the piece he's chosen. Um, so it's nice to have, you know, array of, of what recovery can look like. And I know specifically we're talking about like substances and alcohol and um, so just want to own my, own my truth. No, no. And, and I appreciate that. And, um, you know, so I, so, so you and I spent some time together in commercial real estate, uh, which by the way, is not a bad business. It just didn't work for me. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, um, and then the next thing I know, and we kind of lost touch, but I've always known you as like this you know, like, I don't want to say brand ambassador, but a person that is just, you know, really chic person that's kind of an influencer that's out there and, you know, leading people. And, and the next thing I know, you're doing videos about codependency. So what happens between commercial real estate and, and, and now I'm focused on codependency? What, what, what mm. happens? Um, well, let's actually, we can actually talk about that, that very short chapter in commercial real estate, because now that I even look back at it, like it was a, um, just such a great practice in codependency recovery. Um, mm -hmm. you know, usually I probably would have lasted at least six months to a year and just stay being miserable, but mm -hmm. I committed to this. So like, I need to stay here, even though it's not right. making sense for me at this time. Um, right. I also found myself like once I emotionally detached from, from really wanting to move forward in, in um, commercial real estate, like I found myself, you know, saying that I was going to be going to meet clients for meetings, but I'd be at the Four Seasons bar, like, you know, taking down martinis, having every time I was like, this is good. Like this yeah. isn't, this isn't what I should be doing at a start of a new career. Like this, I'm going to take this sign that like, I need to be moving in another direction. Right, right. Right. Um, so when I left the, the consistent part of me throughout that whole process, and I took really two years from leaving full-time work, I was in hospitality for 10 years, high in hospitality. I like the hustle. I'm an addict, true, true, and, true and true. Like I am a hustler. I like deprivation. I want to prove myself. Um, and I was used to that. So being in this flailing gray area where I had no direction, and trying out new things, which I felt really guilty for. And I also went into a lot of debt during that time because they had no actual plan and I was total debtor, which then mm -hmm. turned into earning. Um, the consistent part was I just, I really enjoyed self-development. I really mm -hmm. first loved learning about um, the self and why I was doing things. And at the same time I was in, um, getting into relationships again, I hadn't dated for five years because the, the last relationship I had been in 
was just so painful. And it was a slew of painful relationships that just got increasingly more painful, all of them um, in their alcoholism. Mm -hmm. And- um, were, were all of these relationships have a component of addiction? Are, are you someone who just is a alcoholic seeking missile? I mean, is that- Yes, and not okay. even, like I was so unaware. The only thing that I was aware of was my victimhood. I felt so comfortable in that role. And then once that last relationship ended, I remember being on the floor of my mother's bathroom. It was Thanksgiving. We were going to a friend's house for Thanksgiving and I was crying, I was shaking. And I was like, there's something wrong with me. There's something really wrong with me. Like, why am I doing this? I'm a smart girl, but like mm -hmm. I keep just gunning for the pain. And right. she was like, sweetie, there's nothing wrong with you. You're just picking the wrong men. And I was like, okay, like, cause it's my mom. So like, she knows better than I do. She knows better than I know myself, which is right. another very codependent behavior. And so I just sort of swept it in the rug and decided at that point, relationships are too painful. So I'm just gonna disengage altogether. I'm gonna take care of myself, which is what I was really doing was stepping into a, a phase of uh, sexual, emotional anorexia. And I had uh, attributes of that growing up, but it really got uh, exacerbated during that time. And, and it sure. wasn't until two years later, I'd realize, well, man, I'm the common denominator here between all of these relationships. Maybe I'm the problem. Right. And that's when, like, you know, when you ask, you ask the right question, the teacher comes. I can't remember what that, that slogan is. Um, when the student is ready. When the, the student is appears. ready. Yes. And I was so ready. So um, I got out of, I dated one guy five years out and I was just back in those patterns. I was like angry, but I wasn't, um, I wasn't actually expressing it. It was coming out through resentment. It was coming out through avoidance, through compliance, low self-esteem. Um, and I had uh, just insane expectations, but I wasn't even voicing them. They were just in my body. And so I, mm -hmm. I just went to this like bad this place again of like what is wrong with me? And luckily, a friend who's been sober um, from drugs, drugs and alcohol for ten years, she's like, "Sweetie, I don't think you're an alcoholic, but you sure are addicted to them." And yeah. I was like, "What?" Huh, huh. She's like, "I think you should. Why don't you come to a CODA meeting with me sometime?" And I'm like, "What is that?" She's like, "It's Codependence Anonymous. Here's the website. Take a look." And I went down and I looked at all the 55 different attributes, and I was like how does this website know who I am? This is insane. Right. And so that was on December 27th, 2018. I went to my first meeting New Year's Eve. I've been home at that home meeting ever since. And, um, and since then it's just opened up Pandora's box to my other addiction. So I, like I said earlier, I, I, um, I am an emotional anorexic, emotional, sexual, and social, but I can go into that sex addiction when I am in a relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I am a debtor, um, compulsive spender. That started real early. And mm -hmm. uh, when I do go into my um, deprivation and, and debting behaviors, I automatically turn off my high potential earning. Um, which I am, a, I am a high earner. Like that's, I've always yeah. been able to like know business, understand, but it doesn't matter if I'm debting, then it's over. Um, so why, why is that? Explain it to me. I, I too have been to a number of Debtors Anonymous meetings. Um, I'm no stranger to any of the rooms, um, yeah. but wh why, explain that to me. Why, when you're debting, are you just there? You can't, you can't be both. Can't be both. Yeah. So I have found that when I am in that deading behavior, that compulsive behavior, and then I end up self-sabotaging and putting myself in a place where, you know, I can't pay my bills, then mm -hmm. I'm not focused on earning and earning actions. I'm, con I'm so conscious of living in the deprivation, which can feel very, way more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that, and then I'm not able to like really think about big picture and where I'm moving towards and actions. It's like the energy is frenetic. The people that I'm selling to can feel my desperation mm -hmm. and, and I'm stuck. It's just so much harder as opposed mm -hmm. to when I'm staying solvent, I'm keeping my numbers, I'm going to meetings. I have pressure relief groups. So I'm just getting mm -hmm. coached by other people, getting other perspective. Um, then I am 
then I'm, I'm earning and I like, I earn big and I earn fast and I'm clear minded. I know my vision. I know what I'm executing. Um, and it's, it's just totally different energy, but I will tell you as, you know, a deprivation addict. And I think all of us in, in addiction, whichever one you're in, like, we're just so used to deprivation, deprivation of love, um, nurturing, comfort, community, uh, that once we get it, it's totally overwhelming. And that's really the right. focus of my work right now is, is, is opening up the understanding to people who live in deprivation, even though it doesn't look like it. Like you can have a lot and it can look like you have a lot from the external perspective, but like you could actually be living in a lot of deprivation and that's what's causing all of this fear. And then once you actually move into a place where you're really living an abundant life, that's actually even scarier because we don't know how to manage that. We've been fighting our whole life to get out of the deprivation. So interestingly enough, do you, are you saying that depriving yourself when you're in deprivation, is that a high? Oh yeah, totally. And it's, and it's unconscious. Like mm -hmm. when I, when I um, dug deeper into my awareness of like, where do I see it? I mean, I can see it when I'm making a peanut butter or an almond butter and jelly sandwich. I'll like, I'll be That's eating them. Like, There's not enough almond jelly. I'm like, well, why am I not putting more on there? Because like in my mind, as I'm making it, I need to make sure there's enough for like five more days. Like right. there's always a scrounging. And the thing is like, it's not even mine. Like I grew up when I went to, you know, I went to some of the best schools. I lived in a nice neighborhood. You grew up with money. Yeah. yeah. Like my parents were fine, but there was always that messaging of people have more and we're secretly resentful. Um, and we don't have enough, but like, and I don't even think that like, it's just gotten passed on from generation to generation. So it's inherited. So hmm. when it got to me, it was like, like, I know I have the capacity to earn. I have. And I remember when I first experienced earning and high earning in my late twenties, and it happened fast. It was like, oh, this feels really uncomfortable. I don't like this. I feel more miserable. And I thought if I become successful, then I'm supposed to feel really good. But because I had the old family story in my head, I was willing to self-sabotage that and, and, and get back to the place of deprivation where I feel comfortable because I love striving. I love mm -hmm. like climbing and having to figure out and problem solving. And, and being in that constant state of um, anxiety. Hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. And, and, and I could talk about this all day and there are so many similarities between our upbringings. You know, my, um, I've just, you know, we're talking about the body keeps the score and, and the last two years have been such an education for me in terms of childhood trauma, intergenerational trauma, all that stuff. This is now that doesn't apply, that doesn't apply. Mm -hmm. but it but it does and you know I look back generations and I've told the story before my my I, I can go back as far as my grandfather who he was dumped off at an orphanage in Poland you know is an angry guy come makes his way to the states my, my dad has very limited tools to work with so he's got some defects when I'm a kid but he was very successful my grandfather was a brick maker made mm -hmm. bricks uh, in, in Germany and was a butcher in the United States. My dad went on to be a very successful entrepreneur. And, and in a lot of ways, we were the Joneses on, on the block. Um, but yet I still, even growing up with that mindset that was because of you, you work hard, you make money, you work hard, you make a lot of money. It escaped me, something about it escaped me. And I, and I think it comes back to the fantasy life that addicts living yeah we're either living in the pain of the past or the fear mm -hmm. of the future and so mm -hmm. much of our recovery process is like getting to the present moment getting to the present moment giving away whatever's supposed to happen to our higher power mm -hmm. to god of un our understanding um and thank god um i want to control everything like i want to think that i'm god and i like right always gets me into so much trouble. I'm a control freak. And, you know, that has its good and bad attributes like bad, yeah. like, uh, you know, I, my life gets unmanageable and like, I get a lot done 
you know, I, people know that they can, re- I'm very reliable and, and I will follow through and I'll always show up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, it's all about context, right? Like what, what the needs are, um, or not what the needs are, but like, how are we utilizing our, our, our personalities in a really healthy way? And, you know, I naturally have that addict living in my head and I like to almost, I like to be an observer and see it as like, oh, wow, like that you're so baffling. And yeah. also remind myself that, um, I'm, I'm perfect as I am. I am, there is nothing wrong with me. Mm-hmm. There is an addict living in my head and it makes crazy decisions if I'm not aware and I'm not paying attention to it. And I don't use my tools and I don't use my community and I don't ask for help. I need to be doing all of those things in order for me to be able to like really show up in this world. And I was not doing that for years. And, and now I look at myself and I'm like, oh, I've been given so much. Mm-hmm. I'm so lucky. And I know that for everybody, everybody has the access to that too. But that inner addict like wants to just be in control all the time. You know, it's funny because I I do firmly believe, you know, when I'm doing an intervention or I'm talking to a family, speaking with a family that um, I believe what I have, what I've been given is a gift. My my life, my life is good. Uh, I have a lot to be grateful for. Whether or not I'm grateful, or is, is another conversation, but I have a lot to be grateful for. And, and if it weren't for the people around me that loved me despite of myself, mm-hmm. uh, I'd be living under a bridge under I-95. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I would probably have the nicest Maytag box there is, but I would, I would be under that bridge somehow. But by the grace of God, I'm not. I have people that love me anyway, uh, yeah. that have, have rode this out with me. But it's funny because, I, I've been thinking lately, I've got these couple of things that are like, that, that I need to take care of, mm-hmm. you know? So I, I owed somebody a gift, right? Um, and it was a small gift, right? Mm-hmm. But, but I'm not doing that. I, I finally did send in the relief was, been, it was, it was a, a thank you for a referral and like, you know, and, uh, you know, the minute I did it, I felt good. But not doing it kept me up at night. Mm. But I, I, and, and it's something I could have handled at any time. And, I, and I've got a couple of things like that too, you know, that these little things that I could easily handle if I just said, take care of this today. Yeah. And they'd be on my life, but they, but they irk me. And I, and I, but I hold, and I, and I must be getting something out of that or I wouldn't do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the addict is totally getting something out of it because it wants that rush of like, oh, I need to do it right now. Mm -hmm. It's not getting anything when you're like in a peaceful state and like doing it, doing it and enjoying it and and keeping it moving. And so we constantly put ourselves in that state. And I know with DA specifically, like I have an action partner that I work with. I check in with Mm -hmm. every morning, Monday through Friday, and check in at like six o'clock at night. Did I do my stuff? Did I not? What am I moving to the next day? And I know people, even that I coach, like, I'm an adult, like I shouldn't have to do that. I'm like, yeah, but you can't, like, you don't. Like, I think it doesn't matter. Like, I will procrastinate. Like, I just will. So, or I'll be hyper vigilant and I'll go, 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 go. I'll hit a wall and then I can't do anything. And like, that's an addictive state as well. And I don't want to live there. I want to live in the flow and I want to live in a peaceful state. And I think that's my recovery process just keeps getting me closer and closer to getting comfortable with that state. And understanding and, and, and moving that. So I remember when I was in treatment 16 years ago, there was a thing that they would read and I probably could find it if I went back through my notes, but it talked about, and I think about this often, about how we're either working our fingers to the bone or we're not doing shit. <laughs> yes. You know, we go to those extremes. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when I was in treatment in 2004, um, we, they, they did, used to do, and I, they probably still do, is something called the fishbowl where they have your, your spouse or your family members, whomever, uh, your codependent come in and you sit face to face, kind of like the way we are now mm-hmm. and, and you you almost you read an impact letter you know you when you when you when you drink 
when you do this, it makes me feel, and it, this is how your addiction is. And, and the addicts, was, and Julie and I did that and it went really badly. Cause you know, my reaction was like, you know, I, I, in my mind, I'm such a good husband. You know, I love you and I do all these things for you. Um, it, shouldn't that be enough? What's your problem? And, and, and I was thinking about this the other day that when I was there, there was a guy there whose girlfriend or wife or whatever came out to California with him and stayed in a hotel near the treatment center for a month while he was in treatment. And I remember thinking, wow, he really, she, I wish my wife really loved me like that. We wouldn't have any problems. That's great. You know, but, but I realized, you know, like, oh my God, how sick is that? You know, <laughs> working with families, I, I'd be like, what the, what the hell are you doing? I don't even let people take their kids to treatment. I deliver them for, for, for those reasons. But, mm -hmm. um, but after this bad interaction, they, they sat us down and the, the, the therapist said to me, he looked at me, he said, you may need Al-Anon as much as you need AA because you're so hookable and you think everything is your fault. And I was like, it is, yeah, yeah. No, I, I completely understand and the concept that if I were a better person, other people would be happier, mm. completely describes me up and up until and past my discovery of drugs and alcohol. Yeah. Oh, that really rings home. I can uh -huh. totally can relate to that. I heard like a great, a great share last night um, where a girl one was talking about how, you know, her parents, if the, the son wasn't out, like she was to blame for it. Like always just mm -hmm. feeling like she was the one who was in trouble or the cause, mm -hmm. of whatever was mm -hmm. going wrong. And so, yeah there's the part of us that feels like less than because of that. And then there's mm. the other side of that. Like, well, if I can cause all these things and I must be God. Yeah. Yeah. So we go yeah. back and forth between these extremes of feeling like we're just a terrible person and garbage and I control everything. Oh, absolutely. You know, I'm, yeah, yeah, no, completely. I, I'm, I'm sitting, I'm in the gutter. I don't have a penny to my name, you know, I'm completely broken, but I'm judging you as you're walking by, going to your, or I see, I remember I was being younger and seeing people like on the Long Island Expressway in Northern Parkway, and they're going to work in the morning and they're in their ties strangling and I'm, and I'm like, wow, how pathetic. I mean, look at these people. They're, I felt so bad for them that they had a, they, because in my mind they were going and they were, had to do time, like it was a prison sentence or it was like detention. Um, so for me, the idea that I was then going to go to work and I interviewed for jobs very well, mm. as I would imagine you do, mm -hmm. as I know you do. Oh, and yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's fun. Most people don't like it. I'm like, I could yeah. do interviews all day. Yeah, I like that part of it. I, I, you know, you know, for me, I can handle the big stuff. We're going in to get a, 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 a Bin Laden today. I'm in. Let's do that. Oh, we're just gonna get dressed and go to work today. That that's that's tougher. I can't. That, that's I have tough. to feed myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Pay oh the rent. God. Come on. Yes, yes. And I think that's a part of that deprivation too. It's like I can do hard things, mm -hmm. but the easy, soft, nurturing things like those were like a really hard muscle to build over mm -hmm. time. I mean, even. Mm -hmm. Like I buy myself flowers regularly. I remember in the beginning feeling like that's too much. Like, mm -hmm. I don't really need that. Um, mm -hmm. And the really learning of like, what does nurturing care mean to me? Nurturing myself, not relying on somebody else. And right. at the same time, allowing other people to come in and, and see my heart and hold me and see, it's funny, like I realize I'm not even scared for people to see the bad parts. I'm an oversharer and that's like part of my codependency that I'm constantly mm. working on. Mm. I'm so comfortable talking about this stuff. Right, right. And- But, but that's I, for a good. I mean, that's a gift that you have and a gift I have that yeah. we can take and use to help other people. Totally. But it that's where that, that has to be directed. Sticky is like in dating, like- yeah, I want to, my, my inner addict wants to get everything on the table and like tell you everything. So like, if you're going to judge me, we can get it over with um, right, right. instead of like somebody really taking the time, like getting to know me. 
Um, and then also like where I feel the discomfort is like that intimacy, like mm -hmm. being with somebody and looking into each other's eyes, even in a non-sexual way. And, and it just like, I'm like, oh my God, like, please don't, don't see right. That's sort of like the next phase of my recovery. Right. Y yeah, no, totally. And, you know, like having to get those disclosures out there. And so, you know, for me, I, I was married when I got sober. I'm still married to someone. So she, she's in too deep to she's get amazing. out. I mean, what's that? She was amazing. Julie's amazing a woman, woman, amazing woman. Uh, uh, and you, but I couldn't imagine being single today and having to, you know, go on a date with someone and then say, you know, so well, I really like this person and then say, all right, well, here, here's everything you need to know before you <laughs> get too comfortable. Here's the whole shit mm -hmm. show, right? Mm -hmm. And then being mm -hmm. like, fuck this, I'm not, are you kidding me? You know? <laughs> um, but probably that doesn't happen because as the, you, the reality is, as you're sitting there giving all your disclosures, they're going, uh, you know, oh my God, but, you know, wait until he hears what I've got going on because, you know, it's not pretty for anybody. We just think we're different. So, mm, yeah, I think, you know, what I see just out there in general is that um, I just don't see any people that are not having some kind of issues in any of these areas that, like, yeah. that for instance, um, is a huge support for. Um, if yeah. anything, I see a lot of it, but I see a lot of, um, a lot of people just not in recovery and still living in their pain. So it, that actually just makes me feel like, okay, so like there's, again, like there's nothing wrong with me. Yeah. Um, I just didn't learn how to be an adult. <laughs> right, right. And, 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 and that, that's a great way to say it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now I am, and now I'm holding myself accountable and, and my life is actually like pretty together compared to like some other people, even at my age, um, I'm a slow learner, but I learn. And, right. Um, right. and so just remembering that, that, you know, if anyone is like, Oh, that seems just like a lot, like they're not my person, you know, right. like whoever is going to want to engage is going to be like, okay, she's interesting. Like, yeah. You know, and I, I have such, I, I know I have so many amazing qualities that, um, that outshine the, the dark stuff. And I like going to the dark side too. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't mind going in there, diving deep. And that's why I do like the most uh -huh. work. Um, yeah. So it's just helping me all together, just get more comfortable with myself and knowing that the right people will, I will be attracting in um, because of it. Where before me recovery, I could not do that. Yeah, no, no, for, for sure. You know, but, but. Um, I remember, uh, so I'm caught, you know, completely caught up in, you know, if I, if you, if I were a better person, which, which by the way, if I were a better person means has, has, means has more money, that's code for has, has mm -hmm. the money or the success I think I'm supposed to be having, you'd be happier, right? And I used to, Julie and I used to do this thing, and she's heard this story a million times, is that when I first got out of treatment, she would call me into her office and we kind of the shame and shameless thing going, you know, she's all good and I'm bad, I'm crap and she's mm. all good. And, and by the way, this is not her fault. This is no good for any business, just, you know, uh, toxic uh, coexistence like this. And she'd call me into her office and she'd have the bills on her desk and she'd say, well, how are you going to pay this? And how are you going to pay them? And, and the answer is, the real answer is, I don't know. I have no plan. I, come on. You know, like I'm, I'm like no money. I think when I got a treatment, I didn't have a checking account. I mean, just like, cause I had gone from being, you know, my last hurrah where I had a lot of money to like burn down the bridge. And we would go through this routine a number of times where I'd stand there and I would, you know, like, I would like dove and I, you know, I'd be like, you know, like, yeah. But, but I, you know, but in my head, I know I, I'm shit, I'm bad, and you're good, and I'm bad, and I'm, you know, and I'm just mm. reinforcing this message to myself. And probably the third or fourth time we do this, by some miracle, some God intervention, it occurs to me that I could, and I would, tell, by the way, I would stand there and wait for her to dismiss me, tell me you can go now. So like, in, in essence was, you, you have my approval, you can leave now, right? And so I would stand there and, and, and then this one time I'm standing there 
And it occurs to me out of nowhere, I could stand here for the rest of my natural born life and she can never give me the amount of approval I'm going to need to feel okay about myself. Mm. Just doesn't, you know, it's, it's I'm never going to, it's never going to happen. So I might as well turn around and walk out. And I did. And it's interesting because, and Carolyn Meese talks about this, who's really great, talks about sacred contracts. And that is like, that was a contract, an arrangement that we had, no matter how bad it looked, it was an arrangement we had. And when I had that moment of, you know, um, she'll, she'll, she doesn't have what I need to be okay the contract was over. It was sat, it was broken and done, and, and I worked. And she never and that energy, and she knows it never asked again, you know. And and I'm a firm believer that we can communicate to people in a way. And I tell wives this all the time, uh, more so than parents. So, you know, I always say that my clients are scared parents and pissed off wives. Parent parents are not angry; they're scared, and wives are not scared; they're just angry. <laughs> uh, but I get husbands too. I get husbands too, and. But, um, but they, I tell wives all the time, you need to communicate to your husband, not, not hysterical crying, not being a, a raving bitch, but just, you know, you need to tell him that I'm glad you're in treatment. I want you to stay there as long as you need. I support this, you know, and it's okay that we're missing Christmas this year, but we will not miss Christmas again next year. So you mm -hmm. do whatever you have to do to get well no matter how long that takes. But when you come home, drinking and using an addict behavior will not be accepted in this home. And, and if you can co communicate that message clearly to, to your, your spouse or your kid or whomever without the emotion or without being desperate, they, 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 they will hear it, so. Wow, that's really powerful. Boundaries are beautiful. And like, I, like actually, that's a bumper said, sticker. Boundaries are beautiful. Boundaries are beautiful. Like what you said actually is really important. But like when you're not saying it from like a desperate place and like you're like you're strong willed, but like you're standing in your own power. And that's a lot going back to like what we talked about. Um, even in DA, the like deprivation and the under earning. If you're debting or under earning, it's it's that same energy, right? Like. Mm -hmm. Either way, like when we're coming from a place of deprivation, we're not ever going to be attracting exactly what we want and what we deserve. And right. like, you're really teaching people how to like stand in their power. And that's not force. That's like, I'm staying grounded and knowing that I'm going to be okay, no matter what. And this is, we're going to keep it moving. And I'm going to support you while you're going through this. But like, I'm not putting up with this anymore. And I really yeah. mean it. And, right. and and finding somebody like yourself to have to feel supported while you're doing that work. And that's, yeah. you know, what we, we learn, we've learned through the process, mm -hmm. like we're, we're not meant to do this alone. Yeah. And, and through your work too. So, so what is, what are you doing now? What's Katie Shannon incorporated mm -hmm. now? What's, tell me about the work you're doing now. Um, thanks for asking. So I am, I am a coach uh, and a facilitator and most of my work actually is focused on bringing women in leadership together who are unconsciously um, used to living in deprivation are comfortable mm -hmm. in that place and don't really know it but keep coming up against themselves even mm -hmm. though they've um, had many positions of power and gone through a lot of challenge and overcome them um, and have to just have had wild careers um, they get to a place of, of, of maybe even abundance or, or the role that they, of their lifetime. And all of a sudden they start feeling super uncomfortable and mm -hmm. it's not something that, that we usually talk about. And I think because we're having so many amazing women coming into leadership now, all different races, sizes, ethnicities, ages, mm -hmm. um, I see that as the big next challenge that we are going to come up against every woman. Um, in leadership has fought so hard to get to these positions. How mm -hmm. do we then stand in them and, and stand in our power and, and be able to accomplish what we're meant to accomplish um, while being comfortable living in that abundance and feel fully supported? So I create these small intimate mastermind groups where we, we work through those challenges together as a collective over a four-month period of time. And I call it a personal growth uh, 
personal growth cycle on steroids. And I specifically mm -hmm. look for, you know, women like myself who were unruly, unapologetic, who were too much. Um, yeah. uh, like I like those types, like more so I would say, I look for those story, like a great story and that energy that dry, that driven energy, as opposed to somebody who, you know, went to a, a prep school and then went to Harvard and then went to business school. Like it was just like a natural progression like that. That actually bores me. Um, yeah. I think they're brilliant yeah. and there's space for everything. But I, I like to look for the ones that are like, you know, we're a little off, but like I think in the best way. Yeah, you, you like the diamonds in the rough. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. 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 I mean, and your work can be easily applied to to families that are have a, a child in treatment or a child in crisis or or a spouse. I I you know took up Alan on a, a, I guess about five six years ago, and the first time I was there, they're talking about the qualifier. Julie taking me on Alan on. Mm -hmm. What's the qualifier? That's, Holy shit! I'm the qualifier, you know, and and then we wound up sending my daughter to treatment for um, for some self harm stuff, and about five years ago, and I became that parent who, how do I fix this? You know, because when you're sponsoring somebody in the program, and and the guy, the girl says, well, I'm, I don't want to stop drinking, and well, I'm not going to stop my self-destructive behavior or my potentially deadly behavior. You say, you, you know what, will call me from jail. I mean, I don't have to tell you, but when it's your own kid, that's not good enough. They, the, the let go and let God is not suddenly not good. Enough. And, yeah. and yeah. I tell the story a lot that we were standing on the corner of Wisconsin Avenue and, the, and when she was in treatment, the bus goes by, you know, and I said, Julie, I said, just take a second for her to step in front of the bus. And, and not only, she was not too subtle, but impulsive, impulsive. And, and Julie looks at me, she says, you are getting sicker and sicker as this thing goes on. And that's when I started going to Al-Anon. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, when I did let go, and a lot of families don't understand this, uh, when, because uh, it's a little like, because you're so focused on more control more handling the situation. But when I did finally let go and say, I'm going to, if I don't let go, I'm going down with her. Right. She started to get better. Mm. Right. And I've had this experience with mothers too. You know, I, 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 I dropped a, a kid off a of treatment I remember last year and his mother was really involved. In fact, she quit her executive job to come manage his life, her 25 mm -hmm. year old's life. And she's, she's, he's fine. She's miserable. I mean, yes, he's an addict, but she's miserable. And, and I, and I call her after dropping him off at treatment and she starts crying. I said, why are you crying? She said, I'm so scared. I said, tonight should be the best night's sleep you've ever had. Your kid is in a safe place. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to be obsessed with it. A few days later, I talked to her. I said, you sound really good. She said, yeah, I'm sleeping. You know, <laughs> um, and that, you know, had she, you know, accepted to surrender. So I, I could talk to you all day and I love the work you're doing and I love codependence and I spend more time focused now for myself on Al-Anon and CODA stuff than I do AA stuff. Mm. Uh, I just like it so describes me and and I and I you know and, and again you know the, the readings that I'm doing with the the body keeps the score and thinking about that that childhood trauma and that intergenerally has really grown me. And I say, you know, in the two years since I've started this business, since I've started self Florida Invention, I don't know that I've helped anybody else, but I feel like I've gotten a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> so how do people reach you? Mm. Well, you can um, follow me on Instagram. I am Katie Shannon. And my website is www.shannonkathleen with a K.com or Shannon Kathleen Co, co .com. Um, I post a lot about my own personal experience in codependency. I'm diving deeper into emotional anorexia right now. And um, I love to share the message and engage with other people who um, are feeling the same feelings and not really knowing, you know, what, what are the next steps and how do I get support? Um, and knowing that, you know, we're all on this together. And I, I love what you said, Mark, about 
you know, the, the parents and the codependent parents, it takes so much humility. And I'm not a parent. When I'm mm -hmm. dealing with this with my own parents is that it takes so much humility to not only be able to step away, but also to be like, I'm, I'm gonna take responsibility that I might've fucked up my kid a little bit, but I'm also still a really good person. <laughs> right. And a lot of parents don't want to admit that. Like it's, it's, it's like knowing it and seeing it. And, but like that, that fear of like, oh my God, I really fucked up my kid. And, and in reality as somebody who's, you know, had been on the other side of that, it's, I don't anger my resentments. I've done my fourth step. I just want to be able to have really open conversations of like what yeah. really happened, what was really going on, that we're both human beings, that you did the best you possibly could with all the tools to move forward and knowing that it's going to be messy and crunchy yeah. and, and that's okay. That's the way it's meant to be. And you know, and just because, you know, and, and my daughter's now, she's eight, she turned 18 last year and, and, and I can see all the stuff I did wrong and all the places I fucked up, but you know what, that doesn't mean I'm a bad parent. And if you, you know, you see your mistakes in your marriage and your, in your children, or your, doesn't mean you're a, a bad spouse or, you know, the, the only thing you can really do right is love a person. You know, I do genuinely love her. And I think, think about her all the day. In fact, one of her favorite manipulations used to be, uh, you know, for once in your life, think of me, you know, like when she's trying to get something. And, and I, I always make me laugh because on one hand, all I do is think about you, you know, you know, all, you know you're constantly in my mind. The other thing is that it, it works because it makes you feel guilty. Like, well, maybe I'm not thinking about her enough. <laughs> you know? So yeah, I always say the kids, you know, my kid has like a 99% closing rate. She's yeah. very good at what she does. <laughs> yeah, we are so, yeah. manipulators. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Really good at it. Really good. Yeah, so. yeah. And I, and I will take the other side of that responsibility of so much of my role in my uh, in my family of origin was I wedged myself so far into my parents' marriage that I became like the third person in the triangulation. Mm -hmm. And just are you not a child? No, no you're not. You're a brother. Acted like yeah. one. Um, I have a younger brother two years younger, but like I had to be the star of the show. I had to like feel number one. I was really resentful when he was born, like of course, first, you know, first child problems. And um, it wasn't until just like literally, I would say a couple of weeks ago, like my dad was like, we're going to be okay. Like, we're going to be okay without you. Like, you need to go like live your life and yeah. um, we're going to figure it out. And I was like, but how? Yeah, and, yeah. and, you know, I first, like, I'm like, I guess I should feel a lot of freedom, but at first it was like, what am I going to yeah. do with all this free time, this energy, this mind space? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm going to do, but it's, it, it's, I'm now in this process of like realizing all my responsibilities and manipulations with that yeah. too, like in that yeah. situation. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, codependence and addicts and just like everyone that's part of that pie, uh, we always need something for our brain to be crunching on. You know, yeah. we always, you know, we always need some tragedy or crisis to be noodling. It's not, yeah. you know, we don't like just another day at the office. That's, no, you know, that's no. Good. COVID was like, all right, I'm ready. Let's buck up. This is going to be a wild ride. Let's go. Yeah. It's all the yeah. other times when things feel like sort of okay, that's like, yeah. God, everything's so off right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I want to continue this conversation. I love talking to you. I think you've got so much uh, great things, so many great things to offer families and and and, and individuals that are are trying to wanting to get out of their own way. Um, but but let's wrap it up only because I don't want this to go into it because I do want people to watch it because there's a lot of good stuff here. You've said yeah. a lot of really good stuff and I want people to be able to hear that. So we will do this again. And I, and I would love to figure out how to, to somehow weave you into my, my practice either, you know, because I do have the company in DC of capital intervention, South partner intervention, but I'd love to figure out a way to, to, to bring you into that practice. Cause I really think you, you, you have clarity on codependence and you, you really are, you are, you are getting it. You're not paying mm -hmm. up service. You're really getting it. And, mm -hmm. I, and, I, and I love that. So thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. would love to support in any way I can.
Thank you. So let's end. I don't really know how to ever end these videos. So I'll just say goodbye and thank you. And have, thank have, you. Thank you for this have opportunity. Have a great day. My pleasure. Thanks for doing this. Absolutely. Take care. Ciao. Bye-bye.